What is up my Lorcana goons and welcome back to the Lorcana goons channel and in this video we're going to prepare you for the DLC Vegas or any other big tournament you might have coming up this weekend by going over all the meta decks and putting them into this lovely tier list we have. want to give a huge shout out to Spessy if you haven't seen Joe Spessy Curly's Lorcana channel I'm pretty sure you have but go check it out. This is actually the tier list he used for his video. It's public on tiermaker.com if you guys want to make one for yourself um, but I actually added a couple more uh, decks here because I felt like there was some missing. I even edited the tier a little bit. Um, so I have the first tier up here, uh, tier 0 0.5. This is the best decks. Um, now, it's important to remember that I'm not necessarily categorizing these by power level. Not necessarily like the best decks mean that they're going to win more percentage of the time than any of the other decks. This is more based off of what you're expected to see at big tournaments, maybe your set championships or your DLCs if you're going to go to Birmingham or Las Vegas. And as it goes down, I feel like those are the decks that are obviously still you know, um, in the meta, but you're you're not going to see them as much right so then we have tier one a decks that are more than good we got tier two good but how often are you really going to run into this deck so these decks are definitely good but how often do you really play against them how many people really pilot these decks and we got tier three not very good meaning not a very good chance you're going to run into this deck and quite frankly and not very good in terms of power level as well i'll be real with you and then last we got tier four which is just buns buns meaning this deck is probably unplayable and you are more than likely 99 percent sure you're not gonna play this type of deck or run into it now, i do want to go on record and say if you are playing a non-meta deck you know it doesn't mean that you can't win the entire event right uh we saw josh polt take first place uh during the set three format with uh yellow purple mufasa and nobody thought that deck was a real deck and speaking of joshua polt he was nice enough to send me a mat from the uh, mat company that he has because he makes play mats uh, for Lorcana. This is the um, the brother from another mother uh, mat. So I want to show this on the channel uh, because he is making them right now. He makes limited quantities. I will leave his Facebook in the description below. He said to reach out to him. So please reach out to him if you want this mat. Ooh, as you can tell, definitely inspired by a specific movie. I don't want to say because I don't want to get anybody in trouble for copyright. But oh man, the material is lovely too. Beautiful material. And I have some news for you guys. Josh actually sent me two mats and this one and we're gonna give away in this video because we just hit 5,000 subscribers so be sure to like comment and subscribe if you are a Lorcana goon because it does support the channel because of 5,000 subscribers I'm gonna give away this mat and some other goodies to one person who leaves a comment below telling me what deck you would play for the DLC or for any big tournament this weekend and why so let me know what meta deck you're playing and you can get a chance to win this awesome mat by Joshua Polt and if you want one yourself and you don't win it be sure to hit him up on Facebook so you can order one yourself I will go ahead and leave a link to his facebook profile in the description below all right let's go ahead and break down this tier list shall we first off we have amber sapphire blue yellow now this is a color combination that i personally enjoy as a fun deck but i'm not sure how good it's going to be this format so where do we put it here's actually an example of how i'm playing the deck i personally like playing this color combination more like an aggro mufasa deck uh, we have the heroes in here to uh, justify playing the ana enchanted in our deck which is kind of nice uh, our early game starts off with something like Daisy and Lilo for some aggressive cards. And then we want to play maybe Piglet or Simba or Ana on turns two. Or maybe even a Chicha and a Tippo. Because once we start ramping with Tippo, we're able to play Mufasa early. We can play Donald Duck early, which lets us ramp into Surfer Stitch and Hades, which is kind of nice. I also like going turn three Mickey, turn four Donald, and then turn five Surfer Stitch. Because you're constantly ramping in ink every time. So I think this deck does have a lot of potential. But how often are we going to to see it is the other question as well so i don't think you have a very good chance of running into this deck at your local tournament or a dlc i wouldn't put it in buns because i definitely don't think it's unplayable or anything like that i just don't think you're gonna run into it or see it so um while i do think it's important to memorize most of these lists i probably wouldn't put too much time energy um trying to uh, play test against a, a blue yellow deck i do want to go over a quick mulligan guide for most of these decks if not all of them so if we are playing a deck like this maybe we don't want to keep too many uninkables so i will put back blue it looks like i have a good curve already with the queen um and the lilo so i will probably keep lilo and ana or lilo and simba because that's always nice as a one and two drop if we're going first and we'll put back a, a donald duck because we don't need to but you know what i actually don't think i want two donald duck either i think i'll just keep lilo and simba in hopes to see a three drop like donald duck or something and we did not well we did find queen and a uh queen shiftable character which is good because we do run into a daisy mirror match we'll be able to stop that so that's not bad either i did want to kind of see some ramp though 
so we can ramp into some of these cards. So no early game ramp in this hand, but you know, not bad, not bad. We have some aggression with the lead with the queen shift and then the Lilo Simba combo. Okay, next one, real quick. We'll put back Hades. We'll put back the um Hans. That's more of a later game card, I think. And we can put back this queen because we don't have a shift target. And even the Mufasa, because we have Chicha, Lilo. I really want to see some ramp cards here. And Donald's gonna be nice to protect our Chicha and our Lilo. Bam, we did see Mickey Mouse as our ramp, but we actually have Daisy Duck as well, which is nice because now we can go Daisy instead of Lilo turn one and we can go uh, Daisy Chicha into Donald and draw an extra card off that Donald and then we probably will have to ink our Anna and our um our Donald over here next up we have locations this is referring to the Amber Ruby location Jim Hawkins deck all right, so for the Ruby Amber location deck, I think this is a decent list to uh, look at for reference. Um, shout out Tileman and Purple for kind of making this deck popular a couple sets ago. But uh, basically, the point of this deck is you want to go turn three just in time so you can bring out a Jim Hawkins uh, early on turn three, which is pretty nice. And you're able to play a RLS, RLS Legacy or a Tiana's Palace, basically some location pressure on the opponent. Um, nowadays, though, you have some extra support in this build, like the Fix-It Felix combinations of Taftia, um, Moten, fudge which is kind of cool we're playing sugar rush as well as a one drop so you can move characters to locations for free uh one of the feats that felix's draws us cards the other one gives our locations more willpower so we have some more draw power in this deck than before i think this deck is pretty threatening maybe not as threatening as your average um amber ruby deck but the location aggression is pretty nice especially when you combine it with flynn rider sisu and super goose at the end right if you don't know what the sugar rush characters do the taftia lets you gain two lore whenever um she moves to a location so if you have the sugar rush location the speedway location you're basically going to be able to gain two lore for free um it's only once per turn so that only can happen once per turn but obviously if you have multiple tab two you could just move them and start gaining four lore per turn so it is kind of nice it's a quick little lore burst deck although i do think it is kind of strong i don't think it's the most competitive and i don't think too many people are going to play it you should obviously pay attention to that deck list so you can understand oh if i see my opponent play just in time i know they're playing this deck right so you know what to expect but i don't think there's a high likelihood of you running into it at local there's there's one person at like all the locals that i go to that does still play this deck uh, but i don't think um there's a very good chance that you will see it you know what it is a good deck though like i think i think it deserves to be at least in this tier two section if we're going by like a 0.5 meta uh tier meta i think this deserves to be like in the tier two section because it still can catch a lot of people off guard and i wouldn't be surprised if, if, if a deck like that ends up in top cut at the dlcs so with a deck like this you probably want to mulligan away um high cost cards that you can't necessarily keep in your hand especially on inkable ones like rls legacy uh we did open up fix it felix with the shiftable felix which is not bad i don't know if we need two just in time is a very good card i always want to keep just in time because if we see jim hawkins in combination with the location just in time then that's going to be really nice um there's also a um argument of keeping just in time and rls legacy only and getting rid of everything else and hope that we high roll into jim hawkins but i like the idea of personally keeping this felix so that if we draw sugar rush we can trigger this felix and then we have the shift one as well don't want to keep too many on like i was saying i might keep this queen of hearts because it is a just in time target because we're probably going to shift this on turn three or four um queen of hearts on just in time is not bad either because we can challenge and draw cards but you know what i'll go ahead and just put that away and hope that we draw another five drop and we did we drew a maui as another five drop or a second fix it felix which is nice actually not bad either because now we can go turn two this felix um turn three um we can just in time this felix and then turn four legacy and our legacy is gonna have 10 willpower when it comes out right so let's try that one more time what we got jim hawkins this time i don't need super goof it's more of a late game card i think brawl is a great card to keep in the hand almost all the time because there's so many decks that lose to brawl tuck tuck is more of a late game card and it's very it's a lot better if you're going first uh, so let's just say if we don't know if we're going first yet um and maui and the super goof again more later game cards i'm keeping the felix because i want to draw on the early game keeping the jim hawkins because it has synergy with that just in time if we see it put back four and we would only see fixed felixes we don't see um any locations to draw off that but we did see a little curve of sisu of felix which is not too terrible am i right i would admit i may not be the best with some of these decks so if you guys think i am um using my mulligan incorrectly please comment below and, and correct me um ruby amethyst though is a deck that i do know very well and it is probably my favorite deck of the format it might be personally one of the best decks in the game still since the first chapter and because of that i gotta put it in the tier 0.5 section under the best decks section now here is your average ruby amethyst deck list looking very 
very similar to the build from last format. Really, the only difference nowadays is that people are playing copies of the library as an extra location. I have seen some players like myself play Elsa Fit Spirit as well. But other than that, there aren't too many new cards that get added to this deck. And I do think that if you have experience playing this deck, um, it might be a good choice for you to play in the tournaments. Or if you have experience playing against this deck, then yes, definitely expect to see it in the meta brooms and turnabog followers are some of the best one drops in the game because they replace themselves and now you have a library to make you draw twice as much when you trigger those so being able to play eight of those is kind of nice flynn sisu combo is still very powerful so make sure you have cards in your deck to respect that if you are playing only two brawl or only three brawl and you find yourself losing to flynn sisu very often maybe bump that brawl up to four we have the petting zoo package back in four snake four foxes rabbit snake and three crab crab is very powerful this meta i'm telling you guys don't go questing with your characters willy-nilly against ruby amethyst make sure you do the extra math and ask yourself does my opponent have a crab in hand are they going to get value if i quest with this character we got Maui's, Medusa's, one big Sisu still. I have been seeing people add Tremaine and Beaking as more removal in their deck. So don't go completely based off this list. I feel like this is more of a cookie cutter list. Actually, this is probably the same list as Kendall Burdett, if I'm not mistaken. Be prepared. A lot of people are still playing that card at three or four. So you got to respect that, obviously. And then the addition of library as the extra location. If you thought castle was annoying to deal with, now people are playing extra castles. They're playing two, three more copies of it. It's not the same card, obviously, but it has eight willpower instead of seven willpower remember that i've had multiple people already try and clear my library with seven damage and i have to tell them this is eight willpower buddy and they've wasted an entire turn doing only seven damage to a location instead so those have been big misplays that i've seen so be sure to respect this deck as you can see, I'm very passionate about Ruby Amethyst. I love this deck. Uh, so if we're mulliganing with this deck, this is the opening hand, right? Definitely don't want to keep big Sisu. Even though we opened up this Sisu, it's not worth keeping uninkables in your hand. I think the one, the biggest reason people lose with this deck is that they play too many uninkables and sometimes they draw them back to back to back, right? Um, we have the best curve, which is a one drop, a Flynn as our two drop, and a Sisu as our three drop. And then we even were given um, a, a gracious four drop rabbit. Um, so I personally always, almost, Almost always keep rabbit in my mulligan i don't think there's any matchup where i don't keep rabbit even whole new world decks i just keep rabbit i think it's the best card in lorcana so i'm gonna keep that too so ideally turn one turn a bog turn two flynn turn three sisu turn four rabbit there's an argument to keeping this goat as ink but i'd rather have goat in the later game so i can win with the top deck goat right uh so we did see an uninkable as medusa but we saw some more inkable characters like a second flynn or a, a second madam and this is cool too because sometimes against certain sapphire decks or certain slow decks you can just play flynn back to back and if you gain six lore it, it, gg game's over uh and then we have the, the the amazing curve of sisu merlin rabbit after that right uh let's try this again we opened up goat maui beat prep snake double a uh, triple goat actually and a library um this hand's kind of interesting i've won a lot of games i've won a lot of games in my ruby amethyst career um opening up triple goat and playing goat back to back to back on turns like four five six but it's not worth it in my opinion it's not worth keeping it like this if i had like a one two and three drop i would keep all three goat but i don't have that curve so unfortunately, because I don't have a good enough curve, I don't think I keep anything here. There's arguments of keeping the library because it is a three drop, but very rarely do you play it on turn three. Most of the time you play library on turn four to move a character there at the same time to get some value. So that might be, but we need a one drop and a reliable two drop with this hand. So we're going to mulligan into not a single one or two drop, but not to worry. I, again, I love this deck so much because I feel like I've won plenty of games where I don't see a one or a two drop. On turn three, we'll play Sisu. On turn four, we'll play Goat. And then on turn five, we might play castle, move a character. Castle might not survive that turn five, but we're going to get our opponent to invest into the board. And then we could start playing more Sisus and Foxes to make some good trades. And ideally, we'll see ones and two drops. But just because you don't see a one and two drop in this deck does not mean it's game over. It is not the end all be all. Again, I've won plenty of games where I don't see a single one or two drop. I just personally think that Ruby Amethyst is one of the most consistent decks in all of Lorcana. And I think consistency is very important when you're playing tournaments. A lot of people say that this deck is like a 50-50 and that has no good matchups but i think because of that it also means you have no bad matchups and if you're an excellent player if you're the better player in the room you can turn that 50 50 matchup rate into a 60 40 maybe even to a 70 30 in your favor i think matchups are only so much in lurkana you know what i mean i i've won my worst matchup i've two owed my worst matchups plenty of times at dlcs and i don't think it's the end all be all for lurkana next up we got steel jafar steel jafar is an interesting deck in the meta i feel like not too many people play it it's a very powerful 
beautiful deck indeed and i have been seeing it in the top cut of some tournaments lately but where does it end up is it tier one tier two maybe tier three because it's not a very good chance you'll see it but the deck is kind of good too so i want to i want to kind of put it in the middle in tier two good but how often are you really going to see it what are the chances that you run into it at the dlc right Maybe you know somebody at your locals, though, who plays this deck very well, uh, you know, so if you are playing a local tournament, then the, the, the chances of you seeing it are a little bit higher, but what are the odds? What are the odds that you'll see more than one? You know, good, but will you see more than one during the whole tournament? This is a Jafar list from Top 8 of the Cerberus, then tournament that happened a couple weeks ago. Shout out Larkana Villain, by the way. Um, Jafar uh, Steel is a very powerful deck. We got some new characters in this format to also synchronize with it, like Pete Games Referee, so it's going to be able to stop your opponent from using actions to stop you from shifting your jafar for example so if you're trying to set up a jafar shift play you can play the pete the turn before you shift your jafar so your opponent can't out it with something like a long came zeus for example uh we also got amethyst chromacon in this deck so if you are using your jafar's ability to gain a lore every single time you draw you can use chromacon to draw an extra card and you start gaining a lore every single time Obviously, Chromacon gives your opponent a card too, so be aware of that. I think my favorite card in this deck, though, has to be Blue Fairy. Blue Fairy is a two-cost 1-1 one, one with Evasive that lets you draw a card every time you play a Floodborne. So, kind of nice. Kind of reminds me of Bucky. Multiple Floodboards in this deck, like the Jafar Shift, Robin Hood Sherwood, Tinkerbell Giant Fairy, and the new Archimedes Shift Owl, which is pretty nice to see. Very powerful deck. I think this deck is a little bit hard to pilot, though. Sometimes you have to see your win condition from a mile away and know that you're just going to see Jafar Whole New World or something. Something, or know that if you top deck the right draw power cards you can set up your shift to jafar for a winnable play right also friends on the other side will also gain you two lore when you use it with that jafar but yeah, I have seen people at my locals play this deck, and then they'll play Whole New World, gain 7 lore, shift Jafar again, Whole New World, gain 7 more lore, and that's that's 14 lore. The game's pretty much over. Alright, let's see. How are we mulliganing with this deck? So we have Whole New World in the opening hand. Not bad. We got a Robin Hood Sherwood, Jafar, Grab Your Swords, Along Came Zeus, and Chromacon with the Archimedes Electrified Owl. Um, We don't have a... It doesn't look like we have a shift target, but I kind of do want to keep this Whole New World um, for the sake of not having to find it later. Later, we don't play Ariel in this deck, so it is a little bit harder. Um, I will keep this two drop Jafar because tempo and because it outs Diablo, has evasive on our turn, which is nice. I will probably just put back our Floodborne characters, though. Maybe we keep the Robin Hood because it's good on tempo, right? Um, and it's it's a good shift character, so we'll go ahead and get rid of that. And oh no, we drew the we drew the Archimedes. We probably should have kept the Archimedes as well. Uh, so maybe you do keep Archimedes. Uh, you keep you keep the the shiftable characters and hope you draw a one drop. But okay, uh, not terrible because we do have the Jafar as well. So we can shift this Jafar and then seeing whole new world potentially on turn five. And then if we see a Robin Hood goons or an Archimedes or Electrified Owl, then we can go from there and seeing whole new world that way too. It is a whole new world deck, so you got to respect that. This hand, a lot better. We drew Robin Hood Goons, Whole New World, and Champion of Sherwood together. We actually drew two sets um, of Robin Hood Goons and uh, the Sherwood and an extra Goon. So we'll put those back for sure. I don't think we need multiple. Um, we'll probably go turn one, um, Robin Hood, turn two. Honestly, we could play a second Robin Hood in case our opponent is playing Steel. And then they want to go like fire the cannons or something to out our shift character. Turn two, we can play a second one just in case. And if not, we'll ink it and maybe pass or something. And then turn three, we might play Peak Games or... We might just go ahead and shift and um seeing a whole new world maybe we do keep the second one as well that way we can we can slow roll it take our time but so i do like to sing whole new world as fast as possible mainly because i just don't like giving my opponent too much advantage um for a whole new world so we'll keep that just in case and look at that we got and we got another grab resorts and another big robin hood anyway so uh we can go ahead and sh maybe shift both before we use the whole new world there so not bad there it's a, it's a steel deck with a whole new world so you really have to take that into consideration and um understand your matchups because you just can't use whole new world willy nilly against some decks nowadays one more real quick. This one's an interesting one. Uh, we drew a bunch of Floodborns and Blue Fairy, but which Floodborns do we keep, right? Um, I kind of do want to keep Whole New World and one of these Floodborns that I can shift into. So I'll keep Robin Hood and the Electrified Owl Archimedes. If I was going second, um, I'd feel more comfortable, but if, if I was going first, I'd be like, mm, which one do I keep, right? But we'll take this risk. We'll mulligan back three. Ooh, we did not see any other Floodborn characters to shift onto these, but we're hoping, you know, we'll hope we'll see a Floodborn character so we can have that synergy right there with the uh, Blue Fairy. Yeah, that Jafar deck is definitely 
definitely hard to pilot. Let's move on to one of my personal favorite decks, the uh, Blue Cow Sapphire Emerald deck. Um, Clarabelle with um, Sapphire cards. One of my personal favorites. I genuinely like this deck. I am playing it a little bit differently. I genuinely like this deck. I think this deck is strong and it has more than enough potential. I just don't see too many people playing it and I don't see a lot of people have confidence um, whether or not they're going to use it for big tournaments. So unfortunately, I do want to put it in good, but I am going to have to put it in tier three. Not very good chance that you'll see it. To be honest, I don't think you'll run into the uh, Clarabelle Blue Green Cow deck. Now, this is one way you can play the deck. This is Spessy's recent list, and I feel like he's really put this deck on the map in terms of how most people uh, pilot it. A lot of people are playing it with items like Lucky Dime. Uh, he's playing Hidden Ink Caster, Mufasa, stuff like that. The idea is to be able to ramp into your new eight, um, eight drop Sapphire Mufasa so you can get your cards back my personal uh, favorite play is to ramp into Clarabelle um, so you know you can go fishbone quill dump your entire hand play your seven drop Clarabelle and then refill your hand because Clarabelle says if your opponent has more cards than you you match hand size at the end of the turn so I think it's a pretty good card Sapphire has an issue though with not having too much removal so you are playing four Hades in a deck like this I'm surprised I'm not seeing songs like you're welcome and other cards like that but we are seeing a little bit more of a slower package in this list list so i think that's my biggest problem with um this list or this deck in general which is why i put it in that tier section it, it, it's a good deck but there's just so many things in the meta that hard counter um how slow this deck can be sometimes and the lack of aoe or mass removal that you have in this color combo you have under the sea which is cool but you don't have a way to manipulate the strength like you would in amber emerald for example yeah you can play ice block in a deck like this but that's a one cost uninkable card that doesn't really do a lot for you and i feel like if you're going to be playing ice block and lucky dime in any deck you should just be playing it in ruby sapphire right this is another list um, that I wanted to talk about because this, this is how I play uh, the blue green deck and I've seen Earl Meister also play not the same list but kind of similar more of a mid-range uh, style version so on turn one you're playing um, Diablos or maybe even your one drop Clarabelle just so that you can shift that Clarabelle by turn five. Um, the one drop Clarabelle is also item removal which is really nice uh, we're playing Tippos as well. Tippos pretty good actually alongside Fishbone Quill because you're able to play Clarabelle on turn four potentially if you go tur uh, turn one Clarabelle, turn two to Tippo, and then uh, the next turn you can ink some extra cards. So by turn four, you'll have enough to play that um, shiftable Clarabelle. We also got Grandma Tala's in here, uh, the three drop Clarabelle too, the Diablos, so we can constantly refresh our hand. I really like Gaston this format, the six drop on Inkable because he quests for three. And four four strength stat line is an interesting um is an interesting body in Lurkana right now because there's not a lot that outs it. We have your welcome in here because it synergized very well with Clarabelle. If you, you welcome a card, then your opponent gets more cards in their hand and you get to draw more with Clarabelle. And one of the biggest issues with Emerald was item removal or like um big location removal, and now you have your welcome, which is nice. And I'm personally playing like more let it go we don't talk about bruno some hitting codes and stuff like that i think john silver is pretty good too because john silver just outs any aggro deck but unfortunately as much as i do like playing this deck i think it is very hard to counter the wide variance in the meta with um this color combination whether you're playing the item version or you're playing a more mid-range version it's good but it is a little hard to counter the entire meta so for the sake of mulligan and mulliganing i'm using the build that i use um which is the more mid-rangey build so we opened up clarabelle fishbone clarabelle um hooves and then we have double your welcome hades and gaston so right off the bat i don't want any inkables in my hand not very good i don't like keeping songs in most decks in my hand because you got to respect ursula if we are going first i'm willing to keep one song but if we're going second we don't keep any songs because there's a chance we draw multiple songs and we can't ink enough by the time the Ursula comes down, right? Um, but I always want to keep this combination of um, Clarabelle, Fishbone, Shiftable Clarabelle because um, what ends up happening is on turn one, you can ink pass. Turn two, you play a tippo or a ramp. Turn three, you fishbone quill, and then you get to ink an extra time. So you'll have um the you can play the Clarabelle for free. And then on turn four, you'll have in you'll have more than five ink available, so you can shift the Clarabelle you played um the next turn, which is pretty nice. So we're gonna go ahead and get four new cards. Look, we got Tippo. Tippo was a card we wanted. So if we're going first, we have to manage our hand size. So you can't go um ink play Clarabelle. You'll probably have to go just ink pass on turn one because we are gonna tippo. Um and now what's good though is that we'll have enough ink to um play we'll be able to um, play this Clarabelle on turn four or five even if they use something like fire the cannons on this Clarabelle because we'll have more than enough ink thanks to this tippo to get to seven by turn five which is pretty gnarly and by that point you're usually going to draw like three to five to maybe even seven cards with this Clarabelle 
All right, here's another one. We opened up Grandma, Clarible Hooves, Clarible Wallflower, Fishbone, Ursula, another Hooves, Clarible, and a Diablo. Um, I like Diablo in the early game, but I prefer it when we have the shift target, so we won't keep that. We don't need two Clarabels. We have the combo again of Fishbone, Clarabelle, Clarabelle, um, which is good so we can shift. Uh, we probably do want this Ursula because there is a world where we run into like Amber Steel or something, and you got to respect like the, their ability to whole new world your hand away, so, or even Bare Necessities your Fishbone Quill, so we'll keep that. And then we don't need to keep Grandma. It is inkable so I, I am inclined to keep it but um it's a card that i really like seeing in the later game with this deck i think top decking grandma or drawing grandma off of your clarabo is so important so we'll put back three we'll keep these four since they're all inkable anyways and we get um two, oh we got a full inkable hand which is nice we got another ursula uh, we don't talk about bruno and a john silver so not bad at all we can kind of slow roll the game and look at our opponent's hand maybe snipe a card play Clarabelle to draw another card and then set up Fishbone Quill so that the turn after that we can play our 7 drop Clarabelle early as heck. So yeah, one of my favorite decks, but I, I wish I could put it in tier 1 as in more than good, but it does struggle against the wide variance in the meta. Good, but I don't think it can handle the amount of variance in the meta, so I think there's not a very good chance you will see it in your big tournaments at least more than once. Honestly, once, if you're know if you unlucky and you don't like that matchup, right? Um, but if you do like that matchup and you're lucky, maybe you will see it once. Next up, we have Heroes. Now, I have no idea what this what this deck is or is supposed to be. I don't know if it's supposed to be Sapphire Steel Heroes or Amber Steel Heroes, but I feel like nobody's playing this deck. Um, so for the, sake of, for the sake of that information, it is going to go in Tier 4 Buns. I don't think you will run into a, um, a, a Phil Hero-based um, deck. I don't think that's very popular. I've never seen that in person personally, but I would like to see somebody prove me wrong. So if you got the Hero Spice, you know, please drop it in the comments or, or win some tournaments with it. Love to cover it. Next up, we have the Spice from Earl Meister himself shout out earl meister for popularizing the emerald amethyst tempo deck um this is a green purple deck that plays a wide variety of cards and its main goal is to gain control over you gain momentum over you by playing characters back to back to back and clearing your characters so i will put this in tier one as in more than a good chance you're gonna see this deck a lot of people have been playing um this tempo emerald amethyst deck and a lot of people watch earl meister streams and and and, and content so um i, I I see Earlmeister post all the time on Facebook and Twitter as well, his results. And I know a lot of people have been very impressed. So I see this deck a lot more at Locals now for sure. I've seen it on Pixelborn Connect a lot. And I've seen it in the top cut of a lot of different tournaments. Uh, very powerful. The only reason I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it in the .5 section with the best decks is because I feel like it takes a certain type of player to want to learn a new deck, a deck that hasn't been popular for the last couple formats. So I don't think you'll see it as much as you would something like the tier 0.5 decks, right? But it's still very good, and I would go as far as to say you're probably guaranteed to see at least one in your, like, nine rounds of Swiss at a DLC. And I'm pretty sure you'll maybe see one or two in the top cut of your big local tournaments, maybe set championships or something. But this is a deck that I definitely think we'll see in the top cut of the DLC Vegas and Birmingham. This this is the most updated list from um, this deck that I can find on Dreamborn. This deck plays so many different cards that my little my little screen was blocking it. But this is the most updated list. This is uh, the list that I've been seeing a lot of people tinker around with in terms of like how they play it. Ratios are very important. I feel like I've seen people definitely mess around with the ratios on how they're playing it. Some people playing multiple Emerald Chromacon. Some people playing multiple on a Diplomatic Queen. I feel like if you are going to play this deck and you're copying these exact lists, you need to focus on remembering how many of what card you play because if you're inking your goats your snakes um your foxes etc um you're gonna want to keep track of that kind of stuff and in this deck you're only playing like two copies of your welcome one copy of castle two copies of cricky one copy of elsa a lot of these cards are flex cards they're like utility cards and they're cards that are used in very important scenarios so you're only playing two of them so you have to know when to ink them and when and what your matchups are going to um, entail in terms of strategy because maybe you're playing against a deck that can drop some heavy locations on you and you ink both your crickies and you might have needed that you know what i mean or you only have one castle in the deck and you're playing against a ruby sapphire player so maybe there is merit to holding on to that castle so you can play it at the right time but i think that's what makes this deck a little bit difficult to pilot is um getting the ratios down and knowing of how many cards of what you want to play and knowing how to use those in every matchup a very good deck though because it has so much utility where i feel like you can have a good matchup against most other decks you have
have the early game control of Rafiki, Cogsworth, Bonsai, and then we have some more mid game control with the foxes, the crabs, the kick cloud kickers, Lyle Tiberius. Let's just keep track of lore. So if our opponent goes a little too crazy, we can slap some Lyles on board and slow the game down a little bit. And making your opponent lose some lore is pretty nice. We also have goats in this deck because that just gets you to 20, right? Um, the new Elsa fits spirit goes very well alongside some of the other power cards that we have like fox and, and crab or even the cogsworth which is cool because that'll give you rush and there's not a lot of removal in this color combination but now we have the two mother gothels to bounce some cards for tempo we used to rely on mother knows best but that card was uninkable and these new mother gothel characters kind of have a mother knows best ability on them already which is kind of nice and uh, we also have your welcome to out pesky cards which is nice and you know we're all playing clarible too because clarible is pretty good clarible is a good card love to see that okay so for our mulligan we opened up double Clarabelle, Rafiki, Ursula, Elsa, another Ursula, and Cloud Kicker. Um, I'm not sure how strong the Clarabelle shift is in this deck, but it doesn't seem like a bad idea. Uh, but we also opened up the Ursula shift, so we'll probably have to pick one of them to keep. So I'll probably keep the Clarabelle and draw the Ursula later. Don't need that many five drops, and Kit Cloud Kicker is a nice on curve, so I will keep that. Um, Rafiki turn one, maybe uh, Ursula turn two, uh, turn three will go Cloud Kicker. Maybe there's a merit to playing this on turn four pop an item and shift this on turn five so we'll put back two we got two we got a snake and a mother gothel which is another way to keep tempo so i right, like our hand it's fully inkable that's kind of nice we'll try it again so we got cogsworth cogsworth snake fox anna ursula lyle not my favorite hand i don't see anything we can play in the early game uh, maybe we can go cogsworth snake to have like some good tempo it might keep that just so that we have a um a two drop play at least or maybe even a card that we can quest if, if, if i was going first i would keep these two just to be extra safe and put back everything else and look at that we got a rafiki for turn one which is cool too now this cogsworth can get us some damage later if we need to we got crab we got ursula we got cricky and mother gothel i like this deck this deck looks pretty good it looks like we're drawing some very nice cards in this mullet next up we have steel cow this is going to be an emerald steel deck um basically utilizing the ability of clarabelle to redraw your hand and using a bunch of songs to gain tempo alongside because what's cool about steel cards and emerald cards is that most of them um cost a uh, very little and a lot of them are songs that you can sing so if you're shifting clarible you can kind of dump your hand and just start refilling it after i like this deck a lot i saw uh, we saw ed chu um get i think first place or second place at the side event for the dlc toronto with uh this list which is pretty cool um i think it's very good but i don't think you'll see too many of them at the dlc because i feel like you have to be like a committed emerald steel player to still be piloting this color combination right now so here's an idea of what emerald steel kind of looks like right now our removal songs are still going to be storm strength we have your welcome now though with we don't talk about bruno and zeus as well for removal we are playing the shift clarabelle targets of the one one drop and then we have the four clarabelle uh contended wallflower which is cool uh, to be able to shift our clarabelle we're also playing the eight copies of mother gothels uh for some more tempo so it looks kind of like a tempo based deck um you're going to be able to control the board with your songs that you can sing or your mother gothels to bounce cards and if your opponent has too many cards in their hand then you're going to be able to refill your hand with clarabelle constantly and we're also playing morph which is kind of cool um, morph is going to be able to um you know take the place of any of the clarabelle shift targets or mother gothel robin hood or sad beast so multiple floodborne shift characters that we play at four of each so we actually have 12 um the floodborne shift characters which is cool three copies of Pete games four kit cloud kicker because we want to maintain that tempo i like this deck i think it's pretty cool let's go ahead and see how this mulligan works all right, our opening hand is Double Wallflower, Clarabelle, uh, Robin Hood Goons, Pete Games, You're Welcome, Gothel, and Storm Rage On. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about uh, Storm Rage On or like, like songs right now in this deck because I don't know how often we'll be able to shift and sing these reliably. Pete Games feels more like a late game card. Ms. Mother Gothel also feels more like a later game card, like when I'm trying to gain tempo. The Shift Four is kind of nice though. So if I did have the other Gothel then or Morph, then I would keep this for sure. I think I just want to keep Robin Hood Goons and one full Wallflower Clarabelle so we can draw cards. Maybe even two of these because these kind of replace themselves they remind me a lot of maleficent so uh we'll go ahead and keep two of them because i want to be able to draw cards and there's not a lot of draw power in this deck okay cool so we actually we got a two drop as well as morph um so now we if we do draw a shift clarible or a shift gothel we can sh 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 um, shift this on on the morph in itself which is cool uh, so we can go Robin Hood Morph, and then our opponent has to answer one of these before we can shift this Robin Hood, and then maybe on turn four we can play Clarabel, Clarabel, draw a card, and see another Clarabel, which would be kind of nice, right? Uh, next game, let's see what happens. Okay, we got Double Sad Beast, a Wallflower Clarabel, um, a Light on Your Hooves Clarabel, 
Gothel, double Gothel actually, and another uh, Wallflower Clarabelle. So we're keeping the Clarabelle shifts, and I think we're putting everything else back because we don't necessarily want um, that many Floodborne characters right now. I think I want some more early game stuffs, and we don't have any early game at all, any one drops or two drops, so I really want to see those. So I'm only going to keep the shiftable Clarabelle targets. We got a one drop Robin Hood goons. We got two of those actually, which is nice, and a kick Cloud Kicker for some tempo. Not bad, not bad. I think this deck has a lot of potential. You know, I just think you have to be the right pilot to play this deck. Next Next up, we have Shift Wheel. Now, when I first saw this, I thought, is anybody really playing Whole New World in Emerald Steel still? Like, that's why I made the Steel Cow one, because I don't think anybody's really playing um, Whole New World uh, with the Morph and Emerald. So, to be honest, I'm going to put this in, in Bun's tier. Uh, not only do I feel like you're not going to run into this kind of concept, I don't think anybody's going to really be playing Whole New World in Emerald Steel anymore, but it's just very bad going into a meta where your opponent's playing Amber Steel Song or they're playing Ruby Sapphire. Um, you know what I mean? Um, so, I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't take the risk personally to play a deck like this and if i sat down in my opponent uh saying whole new world with an with a morphed emerald card i, I would really I, i'd be confused you know i, I wouldn't I, I would be very surprised actually so for the sake of the possible similarities of Steel Cow and Shift Wheel, I will just say we went over the Steel Cow and it's probably the same deck list, but you probably just shove in four Whole New Worlds somewhere. Um, but again, I don't like that concept. I feel like um, Whole New World isn't the best unless you're playing Amber Steel right now. That might also be the reason why Blue Steel isn't super popular right now, which is our next color combination right here. We got Blue Steel. I will put it in Tier 2. I think it's definitely strong enough to be like in Tier 1 in terms of power level, but I don't see you. I don't see myself running into this deck too often. Um, I could be wrong, though, because last time I didn't think um, Blue Steel was that popular, and I played five of them in Swiss at the DLC in Toronto. I mean, sorry, at the DLC in Fort Worth, uh, which is pretty insane. Um, so I will put Blue Wheel um, Steel in the uh, Tier 2. Shout out RMB. Yeah, but even he had to unsleeve his um, Blue Wheel Steel deck. Let's take a look at what Blue Wheel would look like right now, though. This is what I imagine Blue Steel decks look like nowadays. Playing the same power cards as before, like Bell, Lucky Dimes. You got to play the removal of Let It Go, Grab Your Swords, and Whole New World Fishbone Quill combo just seems kind of nice, right? I also like that you can play Cogsworth in this deck because it's a very good out to Amber Steel. So if, you, if you're anticipating a lot of Amber Steel in the meta, maybe Sapphire Steel might be the deck to play. But it does have a tough time going against Ruby Sapphire and some of the other aggressive decks in the meta. It does play Fire the Cannons, but you're not really playing Baboom and stuff like that anymore. Only two copies of Zeus seems a little hard. It's, the problem with this deck is that it's hard to fit everything in, in my opinion. We have the one Cusco, the one Simba, just to make sure we have some removal to locations and items as well in this deck. And we got Tippo in this deck now instead of um, one jump ahead because it's like an inkable card that can ramp us into that four slot, which is not bad at all. Um, but all in all, I think this deck's in a weird place right now, so I don't think it fits like too well in like the top tier deck. All right, now up next we have Amber Steel Songs. This is a very popular deck this format, especially after Brendan DeCanio got first place at the CCS 10K playing Amber Steel, playing four Naveen. So I feel like a lot of people are on this deck and also know what this deck does. This is the list I got first place at that 10k I was talking about, piloted by Brendan DeCandio, and a lot of people are playing the list like this, playing 3 Lantern nowadays. I have been seeing some players not play Lantern, though, opting to play something else like Flutes, maybe the Harp as well. Even some people using I'll Find Them My Flatinum now in the deck, because a lot of Red Blue has been popping up in the meta too, so maybe that's something you might want to consider. I was having a conversation with Citizens of Lorcana on their podcast that's dropping this week, talking about how would you combat the mirror match if you have a lot of mirror match at your locals and we were talking about maybe you playing fire the cannons or boom in a deck like this but tbh i feel like you should focus more on like where it is you lose with decks and go from there and your hardest matchup is ruby sapphire and if you can add some item removal into this package maybe it might be fitting for the current meta because ruby sapphire seems like the dominating deck but aside from that matchup your other matchups seem very favorable this deck is pretty crazy because you could just use whole new world to disrupt your opponent's mulligan and that is really the only card in the game that does that yeah you can use bare necessities and ursula to snipe cards out of the hand but whole new world hits all seven cards so if your opponent was looking for their perfect mulligan curve you're able to disrupt that by shifting a robin hood on turn three and singing whole new world or even on turn three you go lantern turn two turn three prince naveen because you could play a four cost character with three three and quest for two and you trigger the whole new world. So if your opponent was really relying on that one, two, three curve like Ruby Amethyst does, or even sometimes your hardest matchup, that Sapphire or Ruby player, maybe they really needed that fishbone quill or or that removal that they opened up with on their mulligan, that whole new world just completely wipes them out of the game. 
And like I I roll so much when they whole new world me and I already open up cards like Be Prepared or Medusa. And then when I draw seven, I don't see any removal cards. I'm sure it's happened to you guys too. You get whole new worlded for your removal. It goes to your discard pile. You draw seven characters and, all, and you have no removal. And you know, it's crazy is that that's one of the only cards in the game that's able to basically remove cards from your deck before they're even played or the hand, for example. That and the power of using P games referee to be able to go really wide on the board means you have to respect the idea that not all your actions are going to go off all the time. They're able to drop P back to back on you sometimes on your be prepared turn or on your or on your under the C turn. And that could be really impactful because if they're dropping Pete's and stopping your AOE, they're going to be able to quest with their Robin Hoods, their big Cindy's, their Rapunzel's, and that can get problematic pretty quickly. And Piglet is an aggressive card as well. So this deck is able to go from aggro to mid range to back to aggro whenever it wants to right so because of all that and the ability to knock out hyper aggro pretty easily with all the removal i think uh amber steel song deserves to be in the tier 0.5 decks um category along with the best decks right i think a lot of people um are going to assume like oh these are the best decks in the format so i should just play the best deck of the format and i've been seeing a lot of people transition from their other deck to amber steel or ruby amethyst for example after seeing the, their success in tournaments lately it's a great deck, and I think in a two-game format, or even a th the best of three format, um, sometimes they just have everything. They just have it all, and some people are playing it with Daisy now. Some people are adding item removal, you know, so you can spice up that deck a lot too, which is really cool. All right, here's a nifty one that you don't see a lot. Green Actions. This uh, deck was popularized also by Spessy. A lot of people uh, wanted to try this deck out, but I don't think it's the most competitive or the most popular, um, to be quite honest. It's not my favorite deck either. I think the Robin Hood is a little gimmicky, um, and I think if I were to play a Green Red deck personally, I would probably play the Evasive Green Red deck, which is the deck that was played more so last format. So because I don't think you're, you'll um, see it at your turn, your local tournament uh, very often, like maybe somebody at your local is still playing this but um you know uh, because of the likelihood that you won't see it i'm going to put it in tier three not very good to be honest i think it's an okay deck i'm sure you can get wins with it heck i'm pretty sure you could even win a dlc if played piloted and has enough luck into it right but at the end of the day how many people are really going to play green red i personally like the evasive list a little bit more um it does lose out to uh the steel uh, decks as well but i do think it has a much nicer matchup against um other decks like ruby amethyst or even Ruby Sapphire, right? The green action is more of like, it feels like a tempo deck, not super aggressive, but it does net a lot of lore pretty quickly. Whereas the evasive green red deck is extremely budget. It's only like $100 and it's super aggressive, but I still think it could be very relevant in this meta, right? So here I have an Amber Steel um, opening hand. Uh, we opened up Mr. Smee, Pete Game Jeffrey, Double Aerial, Bare Necessities, Rapunzel, and a Whole New World. So that's kind of cool. Um, I'm immediately going to keep Aerial and Whole New World together. I've been told by the great Zach Bivens that that is just correct to do um, because you're able to, you know, sing Whole New World right after. I don't think I want two Aerial though because if I am going to use this Whole New World right after, maybe I won't play the other Aerial. It, it is likely that I, that I could play it as well and just kind of keep it on board. But um, I don't know. I kind of want to find a one drop or even a lantern all right so we're gonna put back one aerial a p a bear and a rapunzel because i really want to see a lantern or a one drop and there we go we saw lantern and a one drop so very good there that, and that's really what you want to do with this deck um you on most decks you really want to commit to that strategy of what you want to see turns one through four and try and get there as efficiently as possible so now we have robin Hood for turn one lantern for turn two and then we can play aerial on turn three and even go as far as to maybe um play doubles me on turn four before we whole new world which is pretty cool Let's go ahead and try another one. We opened up Robin Hood Goons. We have a Shift Hood. And then we have a Piglet, an Ariel, a Cinderella Stouthearted, another whole new world, and a Mr. Smee. This hand is extremely good. I almost want to keep most of this. We're just going to put back the Cindy and the Piglet. I think I'd rather play uh, Smee on turn two than Piglet um, just because uh, it has a stronger body. It quests for two, and I don't think I need to go extremely aggressive. Obviously, it depends on your matchup. If you know you're playing against maybe um, the Ruby Sapphire, maybe you keep Piglet as well because you can really turn the gas pedal on them and put a lot of pressure in the early game um but if you're playing against like a steel mirror match maybe you don't want to keep this piglet either way though and going in blind mr Smee is a very safe two cost character to keep uh we can shift robin hood go whole new world turn three which makes me not even want to keep this aerial sometimes because i'm thinking maybe we might just use this robin hood uh, immediately to whole new world but i also don't like um getting rid of too many inkables because amber steel is notorious for playing a lot of uninkables so sometimes you just have to keep a card and tell yourself i'm gonna ink this card and that's 
where I'm going to keep this aerial. It might just be ink for us. So I'm going to, yep, and I end up drawing a P and another Robin Hood shift. So now I don't have to ink this aerial. I could probably ink the Pete in the early game because it might not come down anytime soon. Or, you know, maybe I can play aerial before shifting so that I have some more songs to grab um, before the whole new world. So I think that's a great way to start uh, your strategy and learning how to mulligan with this deck. All right, this is the Spessy Red Green deck. So it is playing some aggressive cards like Merfolk Flynn and the Diablo package, which is pretty nice. You also got the discard package right there with the Prince Johns and the Ursulas. I'm surprised you're not playing Ursula Deceiver of all if you're playing um the Sudden Chill and uh, Pirate's Life. You know, you can sing Pirate's Life twice with Ursula Deceiver of all, and then you gain four and your opponent loses four. So that would be kind of cool. Uh, we also got some more lore bursts like Goofy, Robin Hood, um, which will let us quest for four. That's the six drop Robin Hood. Uh, and so he's a four or five body. So it's pretty strong against some um, decks that rely heavily on Medusa, like Ruby Amethyst, and don't have Ice Block to manipulate. Pirate's Life for me is a card that you can sing with multiple characters if they sing together card cost six and says each opponent loses two lore you gain two lore so like i was saying if you play ursula deceiver of all you can sing that twice just like you can sing sudden chill twice or something you're also playing brawl because it's great removal hypnotize for more discard and draw power bruno and then maui this look looks really interesting i actually like um, the concept of this deck i uh, just as much as i like the evasive deck uh, because in, in the current format right now where everyone might be playing red blue to counter the amount of amber steel maybe you want to play an aggressive deck that can go merfolk flynn rider double merfolk or something right all right so if we're gonna mulligan with this deck let's just assume we're always going first right um we have no one drop and we do play diablos and merfolk so i definitely want to see a one drop so because of that i want to get rid of some of these high cost characters that's something to remember when you're using when you're uh, mulliganing in the beginning of the game um we're not gonna get to six anytime soon right i like brawl a lot in any deck brawl can just um out a lot of cards it stops flynn sisu combo it stops flavor shims it stops opposing emerald cards diablo as well so we're keeping brawl every time we might not keep ursula because maybe on turn two we want to go flynn rider into prince john um and to be honest a lot of good players play around ursula like it's kind of hard to resolve all the time um so there, there's a part of me doesn't want to keep it um because i really want to find this one drop diablo but then we'd have to discard our brawl so and if anything i'm going to not keep diablo we're going to keep ursula because we can still possibly discard with this prince john and get some nice value off of that there so we'll get rid of three cards and hope that we see a one drop we did. We saw Merfolk and Diablo right there. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing the shift of Diablo with this Diablo, but then we have to discard our Brawl, and that is very aggressive and very strong, but it could be a little too greedy, depending if we're going first or second, right? So that's something to consider. If I'm going first, maybe I, you know, say, you know what, we don't need Brawl. I'll go for the for the Diablo combo, but if we're going second, maybe I do want to make sure I have Brawl as well, but we have some really nice discard cards with our Prince John. All right, here's another one. We opened up Merfolk, Double Diablo, Pirate's Life, Flynn Rider, and Goofy. So immediately I'm thinking to myself, there's a lot of uninkables in this hand. So I don't want to keep too many of these uninkables. And Pirate's Life is a very high cost card. So we're not going to use it anytime soon. Super Goof is really reliant, in my opinion, on if you're going first or second. And it's also important to know the matchup when you're using this card. It's a card that I would prefer to top deck later and not really see in my opening hand. Um, just the same thing with something like Sudden Chill. Sudden Chill can be really good in this deck, though, because you can combo with Prince John. But oftentimes I'm weary about keeping songs in my hand because of Emerald Mirror Matches, because if I draw too many songs, songs then you can't get rid of them all right um but in fact i might just keep one diablo and one sudden chill because we have a curve merfolk flynn rider diablo for one two three and if we end up seeing a one drop diablo then we can even go as far as to shift that by discarding the sudden chill right let's see what we get by putting back three cards oh look we got a one drop diablo like i said could happen we got a robin hood and a we don't talk about bruno so we did draw too many songs which is an issue uh, because if we're going second and our opponent has ursula we're not going to be able to ink all our songs away but what's really cool is that if in order for us to not get punished we can play diablo look at our opponent's hand we can decide if we need to shift if they have an ursula or not and if they do have ursula then we can make sure we discard one of the songs to shift diablo and we have to make sure that we also inked the other song so then we don't get got by ursula no more so that's how you mulligan and that's kind of how you play your first few turns with this deck i think next up we have a mill deck now i'll be real with you I don't think Mill is a real deck. I don't think this has ever been a real deck. I, if, some, if somebody starts playing um, this lady, this green lady Tremaine on me and whole new worlds and trying to deck me out, I, I'm gonna giggle. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that's never gonna happen. So I will put this in tier four 
buns. Uh, no offense to anybody who's trying to make Mill a real deck. I'm sure you can make it a real deck. Uh, but uh, one of the things to consider if you are trying to make Mill a real deck is a lot of people are playing more than 60 cards now, especially because Amber Steel Songs, this is already a Mill deck incorporated in, in the deck itself. I've always felt like Amber Steel Song almost has like a, an emergency fail safe against a lot of decks, including Ruby Sapphire, where you can just deck them out. Because if you use all four whole new worlds, that's 21 cards from the deck that you got rid of right so if your opponent is playing a ruby amethyst deck for example or something like ruby sapphire where they draw a lot of cards or they dig a lot of their cards constantly you can actually deck them out as a fail safe and i feel like that deck has a better deck out strategy than the actual mill deck strategy right so put mill in tier four because i really don't think you're going to run into that at any tournament anytime soon next up we have items Ooh, this is the item control the ruby sapphire item deck now we've seen a couple variants of this deck we saw the ruby sapphire deck dominate the dlc bologna and get first place and then we've also seen the um item prince john deck get first place at a huge event um piloted by micah from the forbidden mountain here is an example of the other ruby sapphire variant that runs around in the meta i think this is important to note because this deck is actually pretty good in my opinion um a lot of people uh, tried this out after this uh, similar list won um the dlc in bologna and i think it's it deserves to be respected and you kind of have to pay attention to the cards that this deck plays as, as opposed to the um the normal quote-unquote normal uh ruby sapphire ice block version right because this version is playing cards like scuttle um scuttle is a two drop that lets you look for items from the top of your deck and you're playing a lot of items so you're going to be able to resolve that scuttle and i feel like at the moment you see an opponent ink scuttle or play scuttle you should know oh they're playing the queen diviner item style deck and this deck is a little bit different because it doesn't necessarily play the same amount of removal as the other uh, ruby sapphire deck so as you can tell this list over here is not playing medusa says it's not playing maleficent monsters dragons but it does play a little bit more heavy hitter combo pieces like maurice's workshop which lets you draw an extra card for one more ink anytime you play an item so when you combo that off with the queen diviner you're able to get that workshop from your deck for free possibly or if you already have it in play every time queen diviner goes off you get an extra one drop item on the board you can pay an extra ink and draw a card so it's pretty nice and i'll be real with you it looks really cool when your opponent uh goes popsicle and draws two cards instead of one because they have Maurice's workshop on there and I like this deck a lot I think it has a lot of potential we got Ruby Chromacon to boost up our Scuttle our Gaston and our Sisus to make sure we have good trades in the early game against aggro decks even Vitalisphere and Shield of Virtue has use case against the early game aggro decks because you're able to attack twice with Shield of Virtue or even give a character rush and attack on the first turn they're played with Vitalisphere and obviously you got to finish the game off with Lucky Dime Tamatoas and the big Sisus so let's go ahead and put Ruby Sapphire item control I'm going to put it in the tier one section so i do think it is more than good and i think you even have a good chance of running into it at a big tournament or a um, dlc because it's a lot popular it's a lot more popular than i give it credit for in my opinion um and i think it can definitely keep up with the meta because at the end of the day it's still um ruby sapphire and i think most ruby sapphire decks right now have a really good um shot at winning any tournament they're positioned so well in the meta right now with the ruby sapphire color combination and with that being said we have the red blue ruby sapphire ice block control deck even some lists not playing ice blocks so just a straight up regular control ruby sapphire deck i think this is gonna have to go in the tier 0.5 section as the best decks honestly i think ruby sapphire control without the queen diviner strategy might be one of the better decks like from all of them like if i had to like just pick one this might be the one that feels the most powerful and it, it has nothing to do with necessarily consistency or ability to win like a two game format or a three game format it's really just the fact that it plays the strongest cards in the game and by that i mean literally the nine cost cards in the game like maleficent monsters dragon and the eight cost cards in the game like tamatoa and i don't think any other deck is playing cards of that magnitude so sometimes it does feel like um the control version of ruby sapphire is the strongest version if not the strongest deck of the format but here's an example of a more control variant for the ruby sapphire deck as you can see it's not playing as many items but we are playing two copies of ice block the madame medusa's the sisu package to make our ice block even better that's going to be the sisu daring visitor that pops a card with one strength so you could also combine that with sisu empowered sibling use ice block to make your opponent's characters two strength or less and then pop them with the sisus right and this list is playing donald duck i have been seeing people experiment with new ways to ramp in this deck usually i see people play tippo though i think tippo is a 
little bit more popular in this deck right now i'm seeing a lot of people playing four tippo four one jump some people playing chicha as well visions of the future is very popular in this build it's a card that lets you look at the top five cards of your deck and pick one it's like a mega develop your brain and every time my opponent plays it it makes me roll my eyes and whenever a card does that to me i always think that is a good card but just like last format this deck is trying to control the game constantly until they can use lucky dime and tamatoa to end the game this list is playing three lucky dime not sure how necessary that is but you know if you want to see it faster maybe that's how you find it in general though i think this deck plays a lot like exodia for lack of a better term it's compared to something like Yu Gi Oh, where you're stalling a lot of the time and you're just trying to gain little increments of lore so that by the time you have like 15 ink you could just slap tamatoa dime gain two lore pass and then your opponent has to decide okay i have to eliminate tamatoa this turn or i lose next turn and that, that happens a lot with this deck that's kind of the win con and i like cards like donald duck because it's a way to ramp and gain lore at the same time so you know be aware that a lot of people are experimenting with how they play this deck but the biggest difference is that the more control version definitely definitely plays a lot more removal cards like be prepared maleficent dragons brawl even to stop the hyper aggro stuff and since both decks were ruby sapphire decks and they're very similar we're just gonna go ahead and mulligan with the with this version right here and we opened up double popsicle developed chicha harem brawl and fishbone quill so i definitely know that fishbone harem and popsicle is, are very good cards to keep we just finished going over how brawl is very important to keep in most matchups and i think in most decks where you can play brawl you definitely want to keep it honestly this hand is insane i think i would just keep this hand i think the only card i would maybe put back would be develop your brain this is a great card to see later on in the game state in my opinion and i don't think i'm gonna ink anything else other than this card in my hand um so i might actually just keep it so this is just a hand i, I would personally keep i want to be able to go develop popsicle and then chicha and then use fishbone to start drawing off chicha as well and then obviously flavor sham after that so well let's just see what would happen if i got rid of uh, develop we drew a hideaway which is a very good card to ink in the very beginning of the game this is going to out any location but we play three so we don't need it right now we can ink it and then we'll see it later so that's that's one mulligan all right here's another one this one's a little more tough uh, we did open up popsicle chicha so that's nice that's like auto keep for me auto keep in the bra we don't like uninkable cards never keep the uninkable cards and even though tamatoa is inkable he's the best card in our deck so we don't want to keep him for the early game we want to see him later and he cost eight so we'd have to ink him immediately um we don't need hideaway right now i really want to see a flavor sham or i really want to see a ramp card um if we're going first i wouldn't keep brawl because i'm desperate for this ramp if we're going second i would keep brawl because you know we can go ahead and take that extra draw and hope it helps us out but since we might be going first let's put back the brawl as well we have other outs in our deck to that so we're gonna go ahead and keep popsicle chicha i know i said i usually keep brawl but because we don't have any ramp we can't keep brawl this time they're very important you got to think about the deck you're using too and think about its strategy we need ramp for this deck that's the strategy let's see what we get all right we got a ramp card we got fishbone quill and we got chicha so it makes the ramp even stronger visions of the future for some later game a uh, dig in then we got monsters dragon for some ink it's a later game card but it is inkable and donald duck to also get some extra ramp in so this is cool we have a body that ramps so he can quest for two and chicha's gonna draw some cards you know a lot of people aren't playing chicha but i think chicha's still very good in this deck all right, next up, we have the Amethyst Steel Repeat deck. This is more of an Amethyst Steel Tempo deck, not necessarily like the Steel Jafar deck, but this deck is going to use smaller characters, and the idea is to play Pete over and over again with your bounce package, right? Uh, in my opinion, in my opinion, I don't think a lot of people play this deck. I think Amethyst Steel is a very good color combination in general if you're using it more like a tempo strategy, um, but I don't think there's a very good chance that you're going to see it. But uh, you know what? I I'll put it in good but you might not see it because I know a lot of players who dedicate um, a lot of time and effort into playing a uh, a tempo mid range deck like Amber like Amethyst Steel. Um, so I do think that the the repeat deck would probably fall more into tier two category. Like if I saw it in a tournament, I would not be surprised. And I feel like I have enough experience looking at deck lists to know what their strategy is, right? And here's an example of a repeat deck by RMB. Shout out RMB and all of Team Labyrinth. So the idea of this deck is to be able to play a variety of early game characters from turns one through four. We have a lot of heavy questers like Sami, Lawrence, which is really good. We also have goats and rabbits with the bounce packages because we like drawing cards and gaining lore. But the bread and butter for this deck is the ability to play Pete, stop your opponent from playing any actions. Then later on, you can bounce Pete back with your snake or your fox, get some value in there and play Pete again. So if you're you're really really trying to play around that be prepared or whole new world you can loop your pete over and over again which is pretty cool 
We're also playing the Turnabogs, the Brooms, and the Cogsworth as our one drops because we need to cycle cards with our libraries and our castle. We're playing the best locations. You know, you got to play library and castle. And there's even one copy of Spellbook here to generate that extra passive lore because you are playing the Amethyst package that lets you bounce goats. Sometimes you're able to get to that 10, 12, 13 lore. And 13 lore is what I like to call goat range. And when you're in goat range, all you really need is a goat and two bounce characters or a goat, a bounce character, and something like Spellbook to get get you to 20 and uh, this deck really does that because you have the steel card package to do damage as well you're able to use baboom zeus to sing to deal damage on heavy characters and what's really cool is that you have a lot of good four drops in this deck because you're playing four rabbit and four goat and those are very good cards to sing zeus with you could also sing friends on the other side with most of your cards to draw and then you have three copies of baboom because baboom also does damage to locations too and that's very important all right, so here's our first hand with Amethyst Steel. We opened up Library, Pete, Double Bell, Accomplished Mystic, a Baboom, Friends on the other side, and a Lawrence. So we don't have many one drop or two ca drop characters, and we play a lot of one drops, so I definitely want to see those. I think the only card I want to keep in this hand might be Baboom and Lawrence cards, by the way. Uh, we don't like keeping songs because of the whole Emerald situation. We have to respect Ursula or cards like Bare Necessities. Baboom might be good if we're going for uh, second or first because we might need to shoot down. Down a cinderella or a robin hood goons and lawrence is a very strong three drop he has four strength on play unless he's damaged so let's see if we can find a one or a two drop that we can use and there we go we saw turnabog followers broom and then we also picked up another uh merlin crab a snake and a pete so not bad now we have some playable cards i like this we have some cycles some draw power some removal and then we have lawrence on turn three to really to really start adding pressure with that four four body and questing for two all right, let's do one more. We got Goat, Friends, Zeus, Reap, a Double Pete, Turnabog Followers, and Lawrence. So auto keep the one drop. I, we don't have any two drops, so that's what we want to look for. Um, let's go ahead and put back Zeus because it's a song and it's uninkable, so it's not my favorite. Friends because it's a song. We don't keep no songs in this house. Goat's a four drop, and we don't got to worry about four. We need to worry about one, two, three. We need to worry about turns one, two, and three. Uh, maybe we uh, don't keep any of the Pete's because Lawrence is our um, turn three play. So because of that, we're going to put back five cards and hopefully find a two drop and maybe a better four drop than goat which might be rabbit and bam we found a another one drop of cogsworth to give one of our characters a rush we ended up seeing another goat which is perfectly fine we don't have a two drop but we found another broom which is cool because that could be our two drop we could literally just play broom on turn two and i'm totally okay with that right fox for some extra rush power and bell accomplished mystic which is going to let us do some damage later on if we really need to Next up, we have Boo Fossa, and I do believe this is Ruby Amber Mufasa. Um, this is the average Mufasa deck. There's a couple ways to play Mufasa. Um, you know, talk to Josh Polt where he played a yellow purple Mufasa. And I do think while those decks are very good, I just don't know where they're going to be necessarily in the meta just because a lot of people aren't playing them right now. Uh, I feel like a lot of the high, a lot of the Mufasa decks have more of an aggro strategy. And if you're playing an aggro deck, maybe you're playing hyper aggro. So because of that, it's going to also have to go in tier two. Good, but how? How often are you really going to see it in the tournament? Maybe not that often, but you should know what the decks look like because you need to know what to play around. The power level for this deck is pretty good too. Don't get me wrong. I just feel like you have to be a type of player to know the ins and outs of this deck and you have to really practice it to learn your matchups. So um, you can catch people off guard with this deck though, which I like because if people don't know how to play around your stuff, then they are definitely going to misplay. But here's the what the list kind of looks like. We're using daisies to get that early lore along with Flynn Rider Sisu package because that's just strong in itself. I really really like using the it doesn't look like we're playing the Gaston that lets us play characters early. Instead, we're playing four Lantern in this list, along with four Teeth and Ambitions, which is going to let us do two damage to cards and also possibly give us more targets on our side to heal with Rapunzel. And later on in the game, you got cards like Mufasa to be able to get you two lore. And whenever Mufasa dies, you can maybe bring out one of your heavy hitter cards like Turnabog. We have the new Gaston. That's a 10-6. He's pretty crazy. We also have Sisu, Shiftable Floodborne, that quest for three. Surfer Stitch, Maximus is a 3-5, that quest for two. And at the end of your turn, if you have a character with more than five strength, you gain two lore. And if you have a character with 10 strength, you gain five lore. So that's actually kind of crazy. Maui meets that criteria. And so do a couple other cards in here like Hydra and Sisu. So very cool deck, very threatening in itself because of the ability to not only heal your characters, draw cards, but also have floaters like Mufasa. 
All right, so if I was playing this deck and I was going first, I would definitely keep Daisy and Lantern. I don't want this Gaston. We don't need Maui. We I don't think we need Medusa, but maybe in certain matches you do keep Medusa. I'm not sure. And I don't want to keep Pongo. I want to go into one, two, three with this Sisu and see what we can. Maybe even find a shift Sisu, right? Uh, we got Double Teeth, which might not be too good because uh, you know if we play against an Ursula deck, then our songs are are done for. Um, but it is, it could be potentially very good against aggro mirror matches. And then we have Maui and Maximus, so still good. We got a good curve in the opening okay so this is an interesting one we have no one drops or two drops we have double julieta sisu sibling team champion maximus a sisu warrior mufasa and rapunzel um so realistically uh we don't have any lanterns so i don't want to keep most of these cards the only card that i'm really enticed to keep might be rapunzel and sisu um sisu just being a strong card we play multiple of the empowered siblings sisu so we can possibly draw this card later to shift it later um i really want to see lantern or i really want to see a damaged character to combo off this rapunzel because sometimes the rapunzel really is the bread and butter of this deck because it lets you draw cards and you don't have that much drop power in this deck so we are going to keep the three and the four and possibly just mulligan these away if we were going first i would put away this three as well so we can find a one drop but we ended up not finding oh we did find a one drop we found mulan which comes in damage so that synergizes well with rapunzel then we got medusa a shift sisu again like i said we would pongo and a mufasa so not bad at all i wish we had lantern to get into these cards early but hey can't win them all Next up, we have Hyper Aggro, everybody's favorite Laker colors. Yellow Purple, I think, it goes in Tier 1. More than a good chance you're going to see this deck. There's a lot of players still playing the Hyper Aggro deck. And I feel like since people transitioned to Amber Steel, a lot of players switched to uh, Ruby Sapphire because of that. And now some players are going back to playing Hyper Aggro again to hard counter the Ruby Sapphire players. So if you're a Hyper Aggro player, right now might be your time because this deck looks like it has a really good matchup against some of the top decks right now in general i feel like if you open up double daisy or something it's over right now this is what your average hyper aggro deck looks like shout out moyen by the way as you can see we're playing a lot of one drops we have four daisy lilo followers broom and maleficent you're always going to want to see a one drop in your opening hand if not multiple um for turns one two then we got piglet and simba with the bodyguard characters to protect all of your characters that quest for two blue and donald also have bodyguard and yeah it's a pretty simple deck you have the bounce characters of fox to be able to rush into stuff and bounce back your goats the photo sometimes feel like it feels like a game changer like oftentimes if you photo your opponent's cards in the beginning and they can't stop your daisies and lilos then it sometimes feels like it's game over we also got gathering knowledge because it gives you two lore chromacon and a library it's a really good deck and i feel like you have to respect the ability of this deck to get to 20 by turn three or four because sometimes it can happen and the best part about playing hyper aggro in a big tournament or like a dlc is that your games are going to end very quickly you're going to have plenty of time to go to the bathroom go get a snack in between rounds and those are the real winners all right, this is our opening hand for this first mulligan. We got Double Fox, Knowledge and Wisdom, Broom, Donald, Chromacon, and Library. I'm just going to keep the Broom and the Donald. I'm going to put back everything else because I really want to find scary one drops like Lilo, Daisy. We have a bodyguard, which is nice. So I want to, you know, utilize those together. So we ended up finding Piglet, which is definitely a scary body, which is a scary body because he can quest for three potentially. And we have more bodyguards with Simba, Baloo, and then a goat to round that off. I was just talking about how the photo might be a game changer most of the time too so i'm glad we see it in our opening hand because we can stop early game cards from popping our piglet right uh this one we opened up broom followers library fox simba goat and another befuddle so since i'm liking befuddle so far i'm going to keep that in my hand and put back the goat and the fox and the library we're going to keep a bodyguard character so we can have some heavy questers and i'm down to keep our cycle um our early game cycle because i kind of just want to draw some cards um in the, in the early game so i'm not i don't actually i, I might put back befuddle because we don't have any scary questers. I mean, photo's good with a scary quester, so we'll put back the broom and keep the followers. We'll go Simba as our two drop, and we'll hope to see some nice stuff. Ooh, yes, I like this. We actually saw some really strong one drop characters. We have Daisy, Lilo, Double Maleficent now, and Turnabog followers. This looks like GG's if you go first, right? Because you can befuddle anything that can sing any songs too. That sounds really nice. See, sometimes hyper aggro just opens up like this, and it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter. You just lose anyways. All right, next up we got Blurple, combination of blue and purple. This deck utilizes a lot of bounce characters to bounce back your ramp characters of Dono, Tippo, and maybe Mickey Detective. It was very hyped at the beginning of the format, and I feel like as of recently, a lot of the Blurple players fell off or just kind of switched to other decks. So because of that, I am going to put it in the tier three section. I don't think there's a very good chance that you will run into this deck at 
your local tournaments or dlcs but it is really good like it, it's good um, but how often are you really going to see it right and i just feel like if you're playing the the purple cards right now you're not playing it with blue there's a couple other uh, combinations where amethyst feels a lot better or more comfortable rather than playing it with the blurple right now I really want to put it in tier two, but I also feel like the power level of this deck is a little bit lackluster because there isn't any board wipes or anything like that. It is very strong, don't get me wrong. In fact, here's a top four list from a big tournament, and I like the idea of it. It can play multiple characters like Cogsworth, Yzma, Hades, and it feels like a toolbox deck. Sometimes you have everything you need against most matchups, but again, the problem is you don't have like a wide range of removal cards. You're very heavily relying on the two Let It Go, two Hades, and two Yzma for your removal, which can be a little tough, but ramping into Mufasa sounds pretty crazy. What I like about Blurple too is that it shines in a ruby amethyst meta so if um you're anticipating ruby amethyst to be really popular at your next dlc or your set championship maybe blurple is a meta call you know maybe you do play this because if you make it to top cut and you play a bunch of ruby amethyst in top cut back to back you'll have a very strong chance because that is like usually a really good matchup what's good about this deck is that it has a good matchup against ruby sapphire too because a lot of the cards do not get wiped out by like be prepared without necessarily you gaining some value most of the time they're able to generate value on you before they can use board wipes and you have a lot of four strength characters like the foxes the yzmas the elses and the mufasas so cards like um sisu and medusa struggle against characters that have strong strength like that but yeah you definitely want to open up in the early game with turnabogs and tippos and mickeys and then use your snakes to be able to bounce them back to ink rapidly <laughs> so that's why you have more um than the average eight bounce characters in his deck because we have that two extra elephant there too it got a quick mulligan in here. We opened up Cogsworth, double Elsa, and then an Elsa Fifth Spirit as well. Accomplished Mystic Bell, Hades, and a Merlin Crab. We don't want the Inkables. Even though we can shift the Elsa, we're not keeping it because it's a 5-drop. Bell's also a 5-drop, and we don't like high-cost characters. We need some ramp, and we need some bounce. So we're going to put back all 6. Honestly, we'll put back all 7. Cogsworth is not my favorite one drop. I mean, we need ramp and bounce. We didn't see a single ramp and bounce card, but we did see a lot of draw power. So if we're not playing against a whole new world deck, this might get us there as well. Let's try that one more time. We opened up Friends, Library, Rabbit, Elsa Fit Spirit, Yzma, Madam M Snake, and Mufasa. Let's go ahead and keep i'm just gonna keep the rabbit i think rabbit's the best card in lorcana and that's the only card i'm gonna keep because it's very good it's a very good card no matter what against any matchup we're not keeping friends because we don't like keeping songs because we got to respect ursula we opened up a one drop this time not bad turn followers no two drop but maybe we'll find one after maybe some ramp and we got some bounce characters if we do end up finding tippo a crab and a merlin goat so as you can see from these mulligans it doesn't seem like i'm getting the most like powerful hands sometimes right but this game is about much more than power. It's also about strategy. And I feel like strategy can go a really long way. So because of that, I will put Blurple in the tier two. Good. But is it really the day for Blurple? Is it really going to be the day where Blurple has the best matchup across the board? Not, And I don't necessarily think so, but I do think it does have its place in the meta. So you got to make sure you respect that deck as well. Now we have Lemon Lime coming up next. I like this deck a lot. I think this deck is really powerful. In fact, I think it goes in the tier one section. We saw Diego Sass take first place at the DLC Toronto with Lemon Lime. Lemon Lime is a very strong deck this format the ability to look at your opponent's hand constantly is really strong and i like that this deck can do that in fact we have 12 cards that let us look at our opponent's hand we got the necessities we got the diablos and then we also have the ursula deceivers which are pretty cool the deck is really strong man if you guys didn't watch the episode of quest with a guest that we did with diego saz he really breaks down how to play this deck and what it is supposed to do you're really trying to control the board and control your opponent's hand and this is the only deck that has a one-sided board removal the combination of kita and under the sea is just insane being able to wipe out only one side of the board aka your opponent's board is very unique and very strong the issue with this deck in my opinion is that it does have some consistency issues but now you have prince naveen to even sing your songs earlier obviously using muses to bounce back your aerials and replay aerial over and over again makes your deck more consistent and now you have your welcome also this is a card that lets you out locations you used to have to rely on cricky to out locations or sometimes locations were like emerald's worst enemy but your welcome will let you 
out them pretty easily. It also lets you shuffle your own cards to draw some cards if you're digging for something specifically. And in a deck like this where your opponent is constantly top decking because you're discarding all their cards, you can use your welcome to give them two cards and then maybe even go as far as to play Lucifer and then those two cards are gone, right? I'm not going to do a mulligan for this one because if you guys want to see how to mulligan with this deck, go watch the Quest with a Guest episode with Diego Sass that we have on the channel where we sat down with the champion of Amor Emerald and where he taught us how to play the deck. So yeah, now we just got one left. We got Red Steel Pirate and we all know where this is going my goons it's going in the tier 4 buns section and if you play ruby steel pirates i honestly think eventually we will get the support we're looking for ruby steel is i think the only color combination that is like unplayable like a thousand percent unplayable right now and I, I hate to say it because i know there are some ruby steel believers some rust believers as they call them but you know i don't think it's going to be a deck that you're going to see at any tournament at any dlc quite frankly maybe you'll see it in the early rounds maybe you'll see it in a side event um but i highly doubt it so because of that we're not going to go over any deck list for the pirate deck but there you have it and this is our tier list the Lorcana goons tier list of what i think you're going to see at the dlc in vegas birmingham set championships or your locals after this weekend once again not to say that this is the exact power level of the decks i did take into consideration the power level of some of these but a lot of it is also based on the popularity and the likelihood of you seeing this deck at a tournament so for the first three the tier 0.5 decks i feel like you're almost guaranteed to play more than one in your swiss rounds for tier one you'll probably see at least one during your whole day for tier two maybe you'll see one but don't be surprised for tier three you should be surprised if you see one but definitely take into consideration take some time out of your day to look at those deck lists and then tier four buns you're not going to see this if you if i'm wrong about that please take a picture and tag me on twitter and if you run into any of these decks but i'm looking forward so much to go to dlc vegas i can't wait to see and meet so many people and play nine rounds two days back to back of lorcana if we can make day two again that'd be really cool wish us luck lorcana goons remember to like comment and subscribe if you like this content if you want to follow our journey we're on twitter as well hopefully we come back with some prize cards maybe another rapunzel mat maybe a golden mickey but until then stay tuned to lorcana goons and we'll see you goons next time